this week on Sylvia's Traders Lounge. And what we do for clients is, this sounds really crazy, but we answer the phone. <laughs> Most brokerages don't, nowadays don't answer their phones. You're lucky if you get an email back within a week. We're, we don't do that. We answer our phones, we email immediately, uh, but hopefully our, our biggest con contribution to our clients is um, being able to answer their questions. We've been doing this a long time, so we have a lot of experience. We offer them trading ideas. Obviously, nobody has to take our ideas. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, but we'll give them plenty of strategies and ideas for them to work off. So even if they don't want to do what we're doing, maybe it just gives them an idea uh, on how to trade a different different market or timing on certain markets, things like that. Silver's Traders Lounge welcomes you all to yet another webinar where we learn trade and profit. We shall be giving you trading insights on technical analysis, fundamental analysis, risk management, and trading psychology. Thank you guys for tuning in to today's podcast session. Today we have Kali Gana as our guest speaker. And I'm going to read out her bio and then we can get started. Kali Gana is an experienced commodity broker with DikaliTrading.com a division of Zena in Las Vegas, Nevada. Kali is the author of Higher Probability Commodity Trading and a trader's first book on commodities. Kali Gana has become an institution in the industry. She's been quoted in, by the likes of Wall Street Journal, uh, Investors Business Daily, and Baron 39S. She also writes a monthly column for stocks Commodities Magazine and her market analysis is frequently featured on CNBC, Mad Money with Jim Kramer as well as on Bloomberg TV. Thank you, Carly, for honoring our invitation for the podcast. It's truly an honor to have you back on the lounge. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's, it's early. It's uh, 3 a.m. in Las Vegas, so I'm drinking my coffee, but we'll be, um, we're good. We're ready. All right. So maybe the first question would be, since our last conversation, how does a futures contract work in a commodity market for for people who are maybe tuning in for the first time? Sure. So that's a great question. And um, sadly, a lot of people that it's, that participate in the futures markets don't do their homework and um, figure out that very basic question. So that's an excellent question. Basically, a futures contract is an agreement to buy or sell a particular commodity. And a commodity can be something financial like a currency or a bond or a stock index, or it can be a traditional commodity like crude oil, gold, corn, soybeans. So this a futures contract is an agreement to buy or sell that particular commodity at some particular date and time in the future. Now, 99.9% .9 of the people that are participating in futures contracts don't have any intention of holding the contract all the way to expiration and taking delivery of the futures contract, or I'm sorry, taking delivery of the commodity, which is exactly what would happen if you held all the way to expiration. Most people are not doing that. Most people don't care uh, what anything about, you know, owning 5,000 bushels of corn or anything like that. All they're trying to do is make money on the price change. So if they think the price is going to go up, they buy a futures contract. If they think it's going to go down, they sell a futures contract. They can sell it before they own it. So you could buy or sell in any order, just like you can Forex or um, you can do it in stocks, but it's a little more complicated. You have to borrow shares and things like that. But the idea is people are speculating on the price of goods and services based on these futures contracts. And uh, the popularity of futures contract probably stems from the, the leverage and margin. For example, you don't have to put down the entire amount of the commodity that's being traded to participate in the markets. You only put down a fraction. So let me give you an, an example. Um, if you're trading a gold futures contract, you're trading 100 ounces of gold. It's $180,000 worth of gold. But the margin requirement is only like $10,000. So you're basically trading $180,000 worth of gold for only $10,000 deposit in your trading account. As you can imagine, with that kind of leverage, you can make or lose money very quickly. So uh, we generally encourage people not to maximize their leverage usage, but everybody has their own idea of, of what's best for them. So. All right, thank you for that. And then, like if now you're up like at 3 a.m. your time, how much time goes into your market prep before your ideal typical trading day? Sure. So honestly, I do most of my homework and prep uh, in the afternoons, not in the mornings. If I tried to do it in the morning, it would be 
it just wouldn't work. Uh, the interesting thing is though markets, the futures markets obviously trade 23 hours a day. So things are moving. So sometimes uh, what I see at night when I go to bed is not what I see when I wake up in the morning, but um, I mean, that's just how, how the world works. I would say the tendency of the futures market is to actually be um, counter to what the actual market does during this day session. What I mean by that is if, if I wake up in the morning and the S&P 500 futures are, are negative, the odds are they're probably going to close positive by the end of the trading session. If crude oil is higher when I wake up in the morning, a lot of times it, it sells off during the day session. So what you see overnight isn't necessarily going to tell you what's going to happen during the day. Most people assume that's the case, but it's actually almost the opposite more often than not. All right. All right. I was looking through your website yesterday when I was preparing for this podcast, and I saw that you introduced automated futures trading systems. So maybe you can tell us of what benefit that is for both beginning and seasoned traders. Sure. So we do have, we offer our clients access to a database of algos. They're algorithmic trading uh, systems. They're fully automated and our clients are able to log into this database. And there are at any given time, there's several hundred, sometimes we've had over a thousand systems in there. It's not, it's not us that creates them. It's third parties and they, um, and, and they're all pulled together and then our clients can choose. The great thing about it is technology has made it really easy. So if a client shops around within the database, there are performance records. Uh, whoops. Sorry, I lost my lighting. Well, it doesn't even really matter to be honest. So there's performance records in the database um, that display all any stat you could possibly imagine over the period of of actual trading and also hypothetical trading of each system. And if a client sees something that they like as far as risk reward, they simply click a button of a mouse and that trade that system starts trading for them. And if they decide they don't like what they see, they can click another button of the mouse and it stops immediately. So everything is really, really quick. They have full control of when the system starts and stops. That said, the great, the nice thing about systems is it takes the emotion out of it. People don't have to uh, well, first of all, they don't have to do their own homework as far as market analysis and things like that. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. But they also don't have to stress out about where to place my stop, uh, which spy signal should I take, so on and so forth. The system does it for them. That said, systems are not the holy grail. I know a lot of people assume that anybody that's trading an automated system must be making a ton of money. And that's not necessarily true. In fact, systems are really, really streaky just by nature. Because they're all, each particular system is based on a set of um, rules and parameters. And those rules and parameters work really well in some environments and don't work well in other environments. And markets shift all the time. They're, the trading, uh, the volatility changes, the trends change. So those system performances go through cycles. Sometimes it's really good, sometimes it's really bad, but it's really, really streaky. So you have to be careful with that. The other thing I warn people on with system trading is, most of the systems are just trading futures outright. There's no hedges. So you want to make sure you have a plenty of room for excess margin for things to, to move around without you being uh, either forced out due to lack of margin or scared out just because it's it's a little too running a little too hot for you. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great tool and a great way to get into the markets. I would say it's probably not for beginning traders because most of the systems take a good amount of capital to, to run them. Some of the systems will say, minimum of 2,500 or 3,000. And that's that's exactly what it means, minimum. Uh, the recommended figure is usually a lot higher than that, 10, 15, 20,000 to run a system, so. All right, all right, all right. And Kali, you've been in brokerage for some years now. What, like, what would you tell clients when they're looking to sign up a trading account with a broker, especially for you when you're dealing with commodities, futures and options? What would they necessarily look at? Um, so we we're you're you're right. We we are a brokerage service. We're kind of I call ourselves a boutique shop because we're small. We're not we're not huge. We're not the biggest, but I do think we're probably one of the best when it comes to just providing service at a reasonable cost. And what we do for clients is this sounds really crazy, but we answer the phone. <laughs> Most brokerages don't nowadays don't answer their phones. You're lucky if you get an email back within a week. 
we're, we don't do that. We answer our phones, we email immediately, uh, but hopefully our, our biggest con contribution to our clients is um, being able to answer their questions. We've been doing this a long time, so we have a lot of experience. We offer them trading ideas. Obviously, nobody has to take our ideas. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, but we'll give them plenty of strategies and ideas for them to work off. So even if they don't want to do what we're doing, maybe it just gives them an idea uh, on how to trade a different different market or timing on certain markets, things like that. All right, all right. Maybe you can share your screen and take us through your most recent sure. trades on uh, on commodities. You can touch on uh, you can touch on metals, energies, and agricultural commodities. How, and then also you can show us how you hedge with options. Sure. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, do a few intro slides, and then I'm going to also um, I'm gonna show a couple of recommendations that we recently provided to our clients. Maybe that'll just give some people some ideas on in different ways to think about things. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. I'm actually going to switch over. Um, so you're not going to see my headshot anymore. I'm going to switch right. over in front of my computer. Okay. Okay. You can still see my screen, correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, again, my name is Carly Garner. I am a futures and options broker. I've also written several books. Um, most of my books cater towards option trading. So we're going to focus on that today. I have a couple of intro slides, but I'm also going to show you some, some live market uh, data charts and maybe a couple trade ideas. If you have any, if there's anything that I touch on that you Need help with or you have questions this is my contact information feel free to send me an email at any time if you want to learn more about trading futures and options our web address is decarlytrading.com we have quite a few trading videos um, all kinds of fun stuff and it's free it's all hopefully educational and if you follow us on social media you will see a lot of dog pictures so if you're not a dog fan you might want to stay away If you do decide you are interested in learning more and you want to explore more than what we have on our website, if you go to amazon.com, I, I assume you have access to Amazon. Uh, I think it's mostly global. Sure, we do. These are, you do, okay. These are the only three books that you really need to worry about. You'll see about 10 listed under my, if you search Carly Garner, you'll see about 10. Don't bother with the others. These are the only ones you need to, to worry about. They're the newest. We've basically rewritten all the others and put all the good information and updated information in these. Okay, and one more thing, uh, there's a sub substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options. It's not suitable for everybody. I actually say it's probably not suitable for everybody. Uh, before we talk about um, option trading and things like that, I'm just going to mention why I think option trading is is something that people should consider. I know I'm assuming most of the people in this listening to this podcast are trading either forex or futures possibly. They're probably not trading options, especially if you're focused on forex. There's uh, options are really tricky in forex. You're trading against your brokerage, so they're not as popular as they are in in let's say futures or stocks. But there's definitely reasons to consider options. Everybody has different personalities. My personality is not very good at handling um, being long or short a market futures outright. It just mentally, it kind of plays with my head. It's just, I'm not just not comfortable with it. I find myself um, just literally being like overwhelmed <laughs> with, with uh, every tick. So it's, it's just not my personality. I prefer, or I am more comfortable with options because they offer less volatility. You have more room for error. You don't have to be exactly right. You just have to be kind of right. In fact, there's strategies where you don't even have to be right at all. And you can still actually maybe make money by just not being wrong or not being extremely wrong. Let's put it that way. You can usually trade with a lower cash outlay, meaning smaller accounts. Um, and they're very, very flexible. If you're creative with them, you, you can do just about anything you want in regards to risk and reward. Trading is a mental game. 
I believe this is my opinion, but I believe it's 99% mental. And if that's true, in order to survive in the markets, you really have to be able to stay calm and stay humble in both good times and bad times. And that's really hard to do. But I think that option trading helps people do that. In other words, it makes it a little easier to do that. So options are building blocks. They are a way to basically construct a strategy that, or a, a risk reward profile that you're comfortable with. You can buy calls and sell puts. You can buy calls and sell calls against it. You can do any, you, there's so many different uh, combinations and there's so many different ways to hedge with options. If you're taking a primary position, let's say you're tra you are trading futures or currencies or whatever you're trading, you can take an outright position in the underlying futures contract, and then you can hedge with options. So there's all types of different ways to go about it. There are no limits. So I'm gonna, um, I'm actually gonna start jumping. We don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm gonna jump to a couple of examples here. Okay, so you should see a new sh a new screen share. Uh, I'm going to zoom it in a little bit. Hopefully, you can see it. So we write uh, newsletters for our clients, and we provide them with, like I had mentioned before, trading ideas. I'm not saying we're always right, but these are ideas. I mean, we've been doing this a long time. We've learned a lot of hard lessons, and so we try to put together strategies that make just a lot of common sense. And in in this situation, we put this trade out a couple of weeks ago. In fact, I uh, was on Bloomberg TV talking about this exact trade. This is a trade that um, it's this is just an idea as well. Like clients are free, obviously, to adjust it to to fit their needs if they want to get more aggressive or less aggressive. But we give them these ideas. And this particular idea was it was at a time a couple of weeks ago when the entire world uh, were, was bearish in treasuries. That's specifically we're trading in, in the U.S. So this is the U.S. 10-year note treasury futures contract. At the time, interest rates were spiking higher and treasury notes were spiking lower. Uh, this was pretty much happening globally. So regardless of where you are in the world, if you were watching uh, debt at that point in time, you probably were seeing it sell off. And everybody on TV and in, on the trading blogs were panicking. They thought interest rates were going to uh, spike wildly high because of inflation. And maybe they still will. I mean, the, the jury is still out. But at the time, it just seemed like everybody was way too bearish and the market was setting up for reversal. And it did exact, luckily, it did exactly that. But the way that we thought that made sense to play it would be to purchase a call option with a lot of time to expiration and then sell a put option also with a lot of time to expiration, but also with a lot of room for error. So in this situation, um, we were using the March options. They had about three months to expiration. We were able to buy a March call option, meaning that that particular leg of the trade would make money if treasuries went higher above 132. And then we sold the 128 to pay for it. Hopefully you can see this chart. I'm gonna zoom in a little further. But the idea is we, and with the trade like this, we were able to do it at a small credit. Uh, you can maybe see this order ticket down here. It says negative six for the premium, meaning the market took, the market paid us six ticks, which isn't a lot of money. It's a little under hundred dollars, just so you know market paid us about a hundred bucks to get into this position. What we did was we accepted risk under 28. If the treasury market would have sold off below 128, that would have been not good news for us. It would have been uh, actually bad news for us. We would have started to have unlimited risk under 128, almost like being long a futures contract, but not quite. 
So in a in by accepting that risk at below 128, we were able to sell the premium. Uh, in other words, we sold the 128 put, hopefully you can see this on the lower line for 37 ticks. And then we bought the 132 call for 31. Now this was kind of a market anomaly, normally this trade, because at the time of this execution, each option was equally out of the money. So in a normal market, those options should have been priced at the same, and we should have been able to get in at a free trade, but not a credit. The reason we were able to get a credit is because the market sentiment was so lopsided. Everybody was bearish. So the masses were buying puts and nobody had any interest in buying calls. And so the puts were priced higher than the calls at that time. So it made sense to sell the puts and buy the calls, sell the option that was expensive, buy the option that was cheap and hope for the best. And luckily it did work out actually relatively well. Okay, let's look at March wheat. Wheat might be something that uh, it's a little more commodity-ish, something a little more of what you might've been expecting in this class or podcast. Yeah. So. The wheat market is, uh, it, I don't know if you've been, any of you have been following the grains this year, but this has been a really wild market. Uh, all of 2021 has been just abnormally crazy. The wheat market is the only one that's kind of behaved itself and it actually is at a multi-year high. So it's not like it's been boring, but it's traded in a pretty nice trading range. You can see here, this is uh, in April, we, we had our first big rally. And then it's been trading in a big uh, wedge sense and it's followed all the rules. It's held resistance, it's held support. The other grains haven't done that. The other grains have been a complete mess, mostly on the upside and then uh, dribbling down on the, on the downside. But the wheat's been a little more manageable. So what we've uh, recommended to clients, and this was a few, a few weeks ago as well, is as the market was coming up against resistance, technical resistance, we saw uh, you notice that there, the RSI down here at the bottom was overbought. We're up against technical resistance. Now, there's no guarantee that that holds. In fact, we could break through and just keep, keep going. But you can put an option spread together that doesn't have a necessarily immediate risk. So, for example, what we did is we uh, gave them the idea to buy the March $8 put, sell the March $7.50 put, this is a basically a vertical put spread. This is pretty basic stuff. Um, but what's not so basic is we also suggested maybe sell a $9 call to pay for that spread. So what happens is instead of clients paying uh, for these options outright, and I'm just gonna scroll down a little bit for a second. This is what the order ticket might've looked like. If they wanted to buy the $8 put outright, it would have cost them about 43 cents, which is, uh, a little over a couple of thousand dollars. But instead, we decided to, well, we didn't decide to, but we, we suggested it might be a good idea to sell the 750 put and the $9 call. And what happens is we collect a thousand for each of those. So the money that we collect on the two short options pays for that long option. So instead of paying a couple thousand dollars to get into the trade, we're paying basically nothing to get into the trade. The opportunity cost is risk above $9. If the market rallies above $9, uh, then we could get into trouble. We generally encourage people to hedge. Like if it starts to get hairy, uh, you can hedge by buying futures contracts against it, maybe even mini futures. So there's all kinds of things that you can do. It's I'm not saying it's easy, but if you stay on your toes, hopefully you can stay ahead of the, the curve. Um, commodity, this has been a very, just on a side note in commodities, it's been a very, very interesting year. I'm gonna also, do another screen share just to some charts to show you some of the crazy things that we've seen this year. Okay. Okay, so the one commodity that everybody wants to talk about is lumber. Now, honestly, nobody trades lumber, but this was one of the first commodities to um, really come out and, and uh, get everybody's attention. So this is, this is pre-COVID here. Like this is what no lumber normally does. This, it traded around 
400, 250, 300 for years. It's very, actually quite tame. Uh, this is this little sell off right here is the March 2020, which every market in the world was acted a little bit wild during that time because we were, the world was dealing with COVID and so on and so forth. But since the March 2020 low, uh, lumber has been extremely volatile. This high here is not only the all time high, but it's literally uh, over double the all time high. And if you want to count the all time high before this, it's triple. So we had a really massive run in, in lumber. And that's kind of what triggered the whole global phenomenon of, uh oh, inflation's here. We're in trouble. We need to hedge our inflation, blah, blah, blah. But just as everybody was screaming inflation, the loudest is exactly when lumber topped out. You can see we topped out about $1,600, $1,700 per, uh, per board foot and dropped all the way to 500. So it dropped very wildly in a short amount of time. But nobody talks about that, right? We talked about inflation and all the craziness because, oh, great, lumber's at 1,600. No one's ever going to be able to afford a house again. But as soon as it fell, no, nobody heard the follow-up. So now everybody in the, that I talk to, is they always want to ask me, well, what about lumber prices? Are they going to come down? And I explained to them, actually, they have come down a lot. Uh, the interesting thing about the commodity markets is, though, we're looking at futures charts. The price that, that consumers are paying have not come down this far. Futures always come down first and then eventually the consumer price follows. So it does take some time and a more um, kind of a more obvious example is, is oil or gasoline. When crude oil and gasoline start to go down in the futures markets, it takes a couple of months for anybody paying at the pump to actually even notice They're, the prices stay high at the pump. And that's because the producers and the distributors know how volatile commodity prices are. So they know if they lower their price and the price of crude oil in the cash market or the futures market goes up, then they could be in trouble. So they hedge their bets. Plus they're in business. They're, you know, greed is, is something that um, <laughs> motivates people and it always will be for better or for worse. So this is a market that, this is natural gas. This is a market we have been, uh, really fighting, to be honest, um, for a lot, for months now. This is, this is a weekly chart, and you can see that it actually followed most of the rules. You can see these highs here. Um, I'm sure you've been hearing about natural gas. There's a shortage in Europe. Natural gas prices in Europe, comparative to US, are much higher. They're probably, uh, last I checked, in the 20s, approaching 30 dollars if you convert it to US dollars. So much, much higher than what we're seeing here. However, our prices here are still quite high. Um, we're trading between this peak was 650. And we're now yesterday's low was 470. That's a $2 range. Now that's, I say that casually, but that's really actually um, insane. The Natural gas, usually, like this is more normal price action for natural gas down here. You usually don't see natural gas move $2 in a year, let alone 24, 48 hours, which is kind of what we're seeing over and over in this period. So it's been extremely volatile. The options have been uh, really, really expensive. And the interesting thing to me is this chart is relatively clear that... Um, there's a good chance that this 650 area holds, and I think it it probably will. I would I'm thinking because it's so early in the winter season. I do think we probably retest this, maybe make a slightly new high, but ultimately these highs are probably going to hold uh, just like this. If they don't, the next area is much higher. I'm going to go to a monthly chart. If um, if this 650 breaks, there's really nothing stopping it until we get up and towards the $850, $9 range. Now, the interesting thing is in the options market, there are a lot of speculators that are playing this right here. They think it's going to $8, $9. In fact, some people think it's going up to these levels, which is what we saw in 2008 and 2005, which are above 10. 
I really, really have a hard time seeing that because those uh, prices, these 13, 14 prices were, those occurred before fracking. And I know there's all kinds of things um, interfering with the U.S. production and things like, you know, U.S. shale producers aren't producing the way they used to. There's all kinds of stuff going on uh, politically. Um, anyway, but the, the bottom line is we still know how to frack. And eventually, if prices continue higher, that's going to come into play. So I really doubt we see $13, $14 natural gas, but that has not stopped people from buying call options with those types of strike prices. In fact, they're going for wild prices. You would be shocked. It at the highs a few weeks ago, um, people were buying $15 calls, $20 calls for several thousand dollars a piece. So in order for them to break money, break even at expiration or even make money, natural gas would have to go like either at or above all time highs and it would have to do it very quickly. So uh, speculators are probably getting way over their skis. They're spending way too much money on option premium. And so it, for traders like us that have been trading option spreads and even have some short option exposure out there, it's been kind of a nightmare. But in the end, volatility like this is generally uh, very temporary. And so at some point, all the option vol is going to suck in. So people, in other words, people that are paying four, five, six thousand dollars for deep out of the money call options are probably going to have a really, really tough time um, justifying that to themselves a couple months from now because it's probably going to be money that was poorly spent, but we'll see. I mean, only time will tell. Um, let me think. Any particular market that you want to take a look at? Yeah, gold. Okay, let's look at gold. Okay, so this is a daily chart of gold. We've been bullish gold, and I actually am still bullish gold. However, yesterday, uh, gold hit this trend line and immediately reversed. Now it's it's up, I can see it's up a little in the overnight session. So it'll be interesting to see if it breaks through. This, uh, this trend line comes in at about 1870. If we break above that 1870, I think we could go much higher. I mean, I think we could really see somewhere in this ballpark, like the 2000, uh, maybe even a little higher than that. But until we break that, I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait and see. So we had, recommended bullish positions for our clients. Uh, we used some option spreads a few weeks ago when gold was, actually, I think we put them on when gold was right around 1730. Um, and we've been peeling those off yesterday. Uh, we, we helped a lot of our clients kind of peel those off or some of them anyway. Again, our clients have minds of their own. Most of them trade online and they do their own thing. So we give them ideas. Sometimes they take them, sometimes they don't. They kind of get out. Um, some of them get out much earlier than others, and vice versa. So it's it, these are just they're, you know I'm not telling you concrete buys and sells, but I was encouraging people to take profits yesterday because we did hold this trend line and it backed off pretty sharply. Um, we went from 1870 down to like 1850 pretty quick. So we'll see what it does. It maybe it breaks through, and if it does, that'd be great. Great, I'd love to see it. Um, and then maybe we'll put some other other strategy on and try to play to make money, hopefully from here to here, if that's what happens. The tricky part in gold is it can go down really, really quickly. You notice the last couple of times that gold's been on this trend line, things haven't fared very well. <laughs> so, so whatever strategy you use to play the upside of gold, if it does break out, make sure that it's something that doesn't have a lot of downside risk, or at least maybe you have a stop order if you're using futures outright, uh, because this can get nasty. Just to give you an idea, this is, this is a full size futures contract. And I know people trade uh, different size contracts and in various, you know, various forms and things like that. But to give you an idea, like this particular drop from the trend line is $20,000 per contract. Uh, so you could lose a lot of money just being this one's $28,000. I'm not saying you'd hold on the whole way, but I'm, I'm just pointing out that gold could get very exciting on the upside, but it can, when it decides to turn around and drop, it drops really, really hard. Um, let's look at silver real quick while we've got silver up or metals up. 
So we uh, also put out a recommendation to our clients in Silver a few weeks ago. Um, this might be hard for you to see, but it was a bull call spread with a naked leg. So we had advised maybe um, as Silver was pulling back, buy the December 2250 call, sell a 2350 call, and then sell a 20 put to pay for it. The goal was to get into the market without spending a lot of money. And our risk was down here. So as long as silver didn't drop below 20, that spread did just fine. And, and it maxed out between uh, 2350 and 2250. That's a $5,000 spread. So, uh, and, and it worked, this particular trade worked out pretty well. But this, this is, let me get all this stuff off the chart so you can see. Okay. So what we were looking at in silver is you can see there's a, a, a trend line here. And each time it hit this trend line, it dropped pretty sharply. And then suddenly things changed right around this time. Silver broke out and uh, it, did, it didn't quite retest. A lot of times you see markets break out and then come down and retest the trend line. So I was kind of thinking it might head all the way down to 2250 to retest this, this downtrend line and it didn't. Instead, it, it held the, an internal trend line and just kept going. So silver looks pretty bullish to me. Um, again, we did, we did kind of encourage people to lighten up yesterday because it did the same thing. It kind of hit this area and backed off. Um, but we'll see what it does over the next couple of days. If we can close the week above, let's say, 25, 25, 25.50 in silver, that's pretty bullish. And I would say there's probably an argument that could be made to uh, see silver come up into the 28, 29 area. So again, it depends on what it does with here. If 25 fails, let's say at the end of the week, let's say on Friday, we close below 25. Um, that to me would be a signal that maybe um, continue making sure you don't have downside risk and pulling off any profits you might have on the, on the upside. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, I think I've used most of my time. So um, do you want me to go stop screen sharing or? Yeah, you can stop screen share and then we can see your face. And then I can see you have like uh, on, on one of your icons on your trading chart, I can see something called depth of market. Maybe you can tell us how you use that and if you also apply order flow trading in your execution. To be honest, I don't, I don't use it. So I know a lot of, um, I would say it's mostly used by day traders. Um, let, me, let me show you what it looks like. So the nice thing about dome, they call them dome panels or depth of market panels. And the nice thing is it, most of them and each platform is different. So, but most of them have very convenient buttons where you can just literally buy or sell. This is a paper trading account. So I'm going to, I can just click sell at the market and an order ticket pops up, um, buy at the market, buy limit, cancel all your orders with one ticket, go flat, go reverse. You can see I could reverse uh, positions just with one click. That's really the nicest thing about domes. So if you are um, a day trader or you're scalping or you're doing something like that, a dome is great for the order entry. Now, other people use domes because they, they, they're looking at the size of the bid and ask. Um, they're seeing how much volume has traded at, every, at any particular trade, or I'm sorry, price. And some people have found um, information in this, in the bid asks and the volume profile that has helped them to make a guess at where the market's going next. I personally, um, we don't really, I mean, and we could, we're kind of doing position trading, option trading, it's longer term. So for us, dome panel is really not that helpful, uh, but it, it's, it's more for day trading. Anybody that's day trading, I think would, would probably be well served using a dome panel as opposed to trading any other way. All right, uh, I think for now I'll get right into the Q&A section. I see there are a few questions from our attendees. Um, okay. Yeah. So Dennis is asking, what's the core purpose of a uh, futures market? Um, so you're, this is actually probably going to come as a surprise, but the futures market was created 
to allow hedgers or I'm sorry, allow producers of products and users of products to hedge their price risk. So it was actually created to hedge, not to speculate. But most market participants are speculating. But the reason the futures markets were created is, let's say, for example, you are, let's say you're a farmer, and we do have some clients that are hedging their, their price risk. So for example, you're a farmer, you have, you've planted corn, you know, in October, you're going to pull that corn out of the ground, but in, you don't know from the time you plant it to the time you pull it out of the ground, you don't know what the change in price is going to be. If you wanted to lock in your price, you could do that using the futures markets. So let's say you plant your crop in the spring. And at that time, you're happy with the price. You know that if uh, at that time, corn's trading, at, let's say 450. And you say at 450, I can cover my costs. I can make a profit. Life would be just fine if I can sell my crop at 450. So you could sell your uh, you could sell a futures contract, the equivalent to whatever you think your yield is going to be that year, and it just locks in the price. And then come October, if corn is below 450, you did a great job because you actually sold yours in the futures market at 450. If it's above 450, you're going to be a little sad because you left some money on the table, but you had no price risk. And so that's really honestly the purpose of it is so a producer like a farmer can hedge his price risk. He can shift it to the speculator. So if that uh, farmer is hedging his risk, the speculator is accepting that risk. So in other words, if that farmer sold at 450, a speculator thinking corn would be higher than 450 in October or December, whenever it was, might buy that futures contract. And he's taking the opposite side of the bet, but he's also accepting the price risk. So futures markets in short were created for hedging, but they're mostly used by speculators. Okay, noted. And then how can, Dennis is also asking, how can passive investors trade in futures? Now, that is a really great question. Honestly, futures really isn't uh, a place for passive investors. In fact, futures isn't really an investing arena. And the reason being like, stocks are so much more forgiving. Stocks in the long run almost always go up. I mean, there's been times where they've gone down for years and gone sideways for decades. I, I understand that. But and the overall scheme of things, stocks almost always go up and stock pay dividends. But in commodities, there are no dividends and they don't always go up. In fact, commodities always trade sideways. Even though we've seen some really big explosive rallies this year, most of them have, have like I showed you lumber, most of them have rolled over and sold off sharply. And that's typical of commodities because as prices get higher, the people that produce those commodities bring more supply to the market and it pushes prices down. If prices get too low, producers stop producing and it pushes prices back up. So commodities are constantly trading sideways. They don't go up over time and they don't go down over time. So it makes it a little more difficult. So it's more of a trader's market as opposed to an investment market. There is one product. It's called the Bloomberg Commodity Index. It's almost like a mutual fund of commodities. It covers, I believe, 22 or 24 commodity markets, and it's all pooled into one. It's very low margin, and it's um, basically a diversified basket of commodities. So if you think commodities as a whole are going higher, you could, you could purchase one of the Bloomberg Commodity Index futures contracts and just hold on to it for several months or a year or whatever the case is. You would have to roll it over because futures contracts expire every three months, or at least that one does. But that would be probably the only example of a, of a semi-passive investment in commodities is, is just buying the commodity index itself. And I mentioned it has low margin. The margin the last I checked was about $500. So you could do something like that in a very, very small account. And the, the index itself is, uh, it represents about $9,000 or actually I take it back about $10,000 worth of commodities, this basket of commodities. So for a six, seven, eight hundred dollar margin, you're investing, investing, I use that word lightly, in about ten thousand dollars in commodities as an index. All right. And then the last question that we have is what role does risk management play in navigating different types of market environments? Honestly, I, I've come to the conclusion that if you're participating in the markets, your primary goal is risk management. So the only way to come out of this game ahead is to manage your risk. If you're worrying about how much money you're going to make as opposed to how much money you're going to lose, you're probably going to lose. If you worry about making sure you don't lose your, your hiney, then 
at some point you're going to maybe get, you know, get a winning streak going. So it honestly, that should be the primary focus at all times. Anytime, for example, I showed you some of those option spreads that, uh, you know, we had provided to our clients as ideas there, those tend to have naked option exposure, um, meaning we're selling naked options to pay for options that we're buying. So the advantage is we get into the market without spending a lot of money. We're using the market's money to finance our position. But the downside is there is unlimited risk beyond those short option strike prices. So the when we do something like that, we always encourage people to be on their toes, always be willing to hedge. If something look, doesn't look right, hedge first and ask questions later. Because it's if you do the opposite, if you put your head in the sand and pretend like everything's fine when it's maybe not, or maybe things are unfolding to not be, you're going to get caught behind the eight ball and it's going to be hard to catch up. So always hedge first, ask questions later. It's going to be, you'll find that sometimes um, that results in over hedging or hedging when maybe you didn't need to, but the reality is that's probably a better scenario than being stuck in a really bad position that just gets worse and worse. And it plays a, men, you know, it does a, play, pays a mental toll on your mind and, it, and it's tough to take. So in trading again is a mental game. So if you're making decisions that are going to put you under duress, you're probably going to continue to make very bad decisions. So the goal is always manage your risk first, worry about making money later. Thank you, Kali. And then uh, as we wind up the podcast, I know you showed us the three books that you are highly known for. Actually, they are highly sorted for on Amazon. So for your latest publication, Trading Commodity Options with Creativity, what can readers expect from that book? And yeah, in terms of takeaway sessions. So uh, uh, Trading Commodity Options with Creativity is obviously it's about option trading. And what we what we do in that book is we cover, uh, I can't remember exactly, 10 to 12 option strategies. What's the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, how to manage risk, how to adjust them, so on and so forth. And I've tried to put basically all the hard lessons that I've learned over the years, and there's been some really, really hard lessons, I've tried to incorporate into that book. So I want, hopefully people can see, um, you know, hopefully it opens their eyes to some of the risks and how to manage some of those risks and how to proceed without hopefully uh, putting themselves in a precarious situation. But I would say if you if you've never traded options before or if it's new to you, um, I've I've wrote the book in a way that hopefully it takes you from ground zero to to the more advanced stuff. But I would really actually recommend you probably start with the other two books first, and if you're not. Uh, familiar with commodities and, and options. A trader's first book on commodity is very, very basic, but it's information everybody needs to know before they can proceed into the funner things. Uh, and then the other book is Higher Probability Commodity Trading. And that one gives a really good primer on options and market analysis and things like that, which is a stepping stone into trading commodity options with creativity. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kali. Now, uh, you know, you know, analysis is normally featured now, nowadays on Bloomberg TV, so you can tell people how they can get in touch with that analysis, your analysis, and also you can mention your website and your email or and all social media handles as we conclude. Okay, so this is my contact information. You can reach me at decarleytrading.com. It's D-E-C-A-R-L-E-Y trading.com. Uh, on the website, you can sign up for free trials of our newsletters. So you can find our market analysis and trading ideas there. It's, it is on a trial basis. Our brokerage clients receive it ongoing, uh, complimentary, but you can do it, get a free sample and just kind of see, see if you like it or see if it's for you. Uh, trials generally run about a month and a half or two months. So it'll give you plenty of time to, to figure out if it's for you or if it's not for you. Um, also, I, I, as Sylvia mentioned, I do uh, provide analysis to Bloomberg TV. There, in the US, it's a, it's a television station, but you can also go to uh, Bloomberg.com and find the, the live stream. However, I think they do charge for it. So, but um, anyway, you can also find us, DeCarly Trading, on social media. So if you're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, search for DeCarly Trading and you'll find us, and hopefully we see you there. Thank you so much, Kali, for making the time. Uh, we wish you a good time towards the end of the year. 
and we'd love to host you again in the future and also pass our regards to Frankie, your dog. <laughs> Until then, goodbye. <laughs> All right, cheers, bye. Thank you guys for tuning in to today's podcast. We welcome you to be watching our podcast series on our YouTube channel at Silver Traders Lounge Forex Channel. We also welcome you to follow us on all our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and on Instagram at Silver Traders Lounge. You can also leave your details on our website, www.forexstl.com, and we will see you in the next podcast. Cheers.